welcome Dr. Cochran and Dr. Harper. Fifteen years ago, I started having coffee with a friend of mine, ex-alcoholic. He came in about five years ago with terminal cancer. They were going to cut out his throat, his tongue, put him in the hospital, gave him six months to live. This was in January. We started treating him with high-dose vitamin C, took him off his cigarettes, off of his cookies, and started with a stem cell procedure on him monthly into the brown fat into his neck. Six months later, he's almost symptom-free. His daughter comes out to visit in August, and he said, I'm not going to live to 70 anyhow. He quit doing all the stuff, started eating his cookies and drinking his cigarettes, eating his cigarettes, uh, smoking his cigarettes and eating his cookies again. In October, we, Shirley and I flew down to Arizona on a Thursday. Went over by Wednesday to talk to him. His legs were starting to swell. I said, Doug, something's wrong with the kidneys. We'll deal with it Monday when we get back. I got back Monday morning, and Doug would usually open the gate to our house. No Doug. His car was gone from the house. His family called me on Tuesday. Said, have you heard from Doug? I said, I have not. He had a cabin about 50 miles up the river. Now, on the Friday night prior to us coming home, I had a dream. Doug was laying on his back, his right leg bent up. I had my hand on his knee. I said, Doug, it's okay to go now. Sure, and I went to his cabin on Friday morning, walked up to the cabin. There was a cigarette in the ashtray, a wheelbarrow of wood, and Doug was laying on his back with his right leg knee bent up. I was with him when he died. Talk about connections, connecting with your patient, as Dr. David said, is extremely important. Connecting to the world is extremely important. Today we're going to talk about how you connect to the world that makes sense safely and easily. Safe practices is where you begin. Build a family of doctors you can rely on and work with and resource with. My wife, Shirley, we call it the boss of the corporation. She keeps me in line and focused and on time. Dr. Cochran is my go-to that knows something. I figure myself not being very bright, but I'm a big picture person. So I look to play, change the playing field. So today, I'm going to introduce you to the best top procedure out there that you should start doing in your office on Monday morning. Are we ready? You recognize that? You all do that in your office, correctly? Okay, here's the rest of the story. Most of you know what this is. Anybody not know what this is? Younger people may not see this. It's a frontal lobotomy. Here's the truth of it, though. What's the standard of care doing a frontal lobotomy? Is there a standard? We're going to talk about ozone and all alternative care things today about that exact issue. This is a good example of this. When was the last frontal lobotomy done? Does anybody know? Don't have a coup. Probably 1945, 46, you think? Not so. Last one was done on May 6th of 2022. There's a CPT code for frontal lobotomies. You're allowed to do them in your office now. You just have to buy your own ice pick off Amazon. I almost brought one, but I wouldn't carry an airplane. Um, and a hammer, and you can do these without anesthesia. They're totally safe, totally acceptable, and totally within the standard of care. So this is how crazy the stuff is out there and the truth is out there. So think about that. When you're going to stick a little needle in someone for ozone, on, and you just think about doing a frontal lobotomy. These are on a PDF files on your things you can download from um, Frontiers. So you go on site there and download all these all these. All, right, all these things, so. So, how is it performed? People are out of control, and that's how it originally started. So you whack them between the eyes, and you scramble the brain, and they settle right down. So your patients are a problem patient, you may do this procedure, it's legal to do. And I want all of you starting to do this Monday. I got a dozen people I know we should do it on, but that's another story. I won't go there. So. This is where I live. This is where I experience my dirt time to get balance. 
Talk about connecting to the world. I heard a theory a long time ago, God was a big marshmallow. All the people in the world are jelly beans on the marshmallow, so we are all connected. Open yourself, and all ideas are out there if you're open to learn them. So realize, any idea is out there for all of you. This is called Safe Practices. I'm going to go over some things that will ideally keep you safe. And that's the comment. So before I start too much, how many of you carry malpractice insurance? Okay, put them down. How many don't carry malpractice insurance? Safe practices. What makes it that way? Just so you know my history, I'm actually one of the top reviewers of malpractice cases in Northwest United States. So I deal with these darned, I'll tell them darned attorneys, I'll be nice, attorneys all the time on both sides. And it's all about money, and they don't care about you at all. So Keep that in mind, it's a sit. Don't want to have to go there. So we want you to be successful. You have to be safe to be successful. That's extremely important. Okay. So facing the standard of care. Can you hear me there? That's good. Okay, so this is me fighting a huge bull in Mexico after four tequilas. Is that really very safe? Probably not. The bull ran at me and then leaned against me and wanted me to pet it. So what is standard of care? And I want you to think about this for a minute. What do you think standard of care is? Have any of you done malpractice cases or been involved in one? Was it fun? Best time you ever had? It, it literally causes doctors to quit practicing because they're petrified to touch anybody because someone went wrong once. And I get it. You know, I've seen stuff happen. I've seen it in my office happen. But you've got to realize it will happen in your office. There's a high probability a person will drop dead in your office just from walking into your office. Not because your staff scared them or you scared them. It's because it happens. The worst case I heard was an 18-year-old goes in with scraped up knees, sat on the table, doctor sprayed some anesthetic on it, she dropped dead. Does that have to scare the hell out of you? Pretty much. Was it his fault? No. Could he get sued over it? Possibly. Okay, standard of care is a benchmark that determines whether professional obligations the patient have been met. Failure to meet that is negligence, which can carry significant consequences. This is not totally true. There are regional standards of care, national standards of care, and the way your state law writes your standard of care. I encourage all of you to do two really good things here. Who's going to come after your license in your state? Your board, right? Who's going to go after your procedures you do? Not the FDA, FTC. And your attorney generals are now going after people in direction from the FDA. So I recommend all of you get to know your attorney generals personally. I got his cell phone in my little black book number. So those are things to understand completely in your state, what regulates your state to make things like that that drive you to the next level. So you've got to, you've got to protect yourself in a lot of ways. No one's going to do it for you. But know those things are extremely important. I'm also a state senator in Idaho, so I actually get, to, get senator, president, and, and, and governor to carry the titles for life, so I'm still a state senator and a minister, too. So if you need anything, I can help you. Um, so the definition of standard of care is what you get hammered on if you follow the standard of care. If there's a federal standard of care, it was a local. So local standard of care means that I have five MDs in my town, for instance. And you come in with statin drugs. If you do not give them statin drugs, you're not following their standard of care. So you got to worry about how to change that in your patterning and what your constitutional rights are within it, which we're going to cover. So standard of care. And again, another statement on it. Standard of care is a legal term, not a medical term. That's a huge statement right there. And understand this well. Most of your attorneys that come and go to defend you probably will not understand this well. I did several cases with a top litigating attorney in the state of Washington, sharpest guy I ever met, and he would literally tear people apart, and I helped him save millions in several cases, but I learned a lot from him too, and one, what the game is. The standard of care is something that you can actually bury yourself with it and without it. So understand what it looks like, look at who's around you, look at their general treatment protocols and, and systems, and then build a system that's defensible. And we'll talk about that as we go along here. 
So I said, know your demographics. This is where I live. We have wolves in our backyard. We have bears in our backyard. We have deer and elk in our backyard. It's a little different demographics. Our people are hardworking people, and, you know, they're really good. You, you screw up something, you break a rib, they say, oh, it'll fix up, it'll be better in a week. You focus, you concentrate with them. You actually tell them risks, very simply, basically. People ask a risk of doing an injection. I said, you could die. But it's your fault if you die. And I actually tell them that. Sure, he'll tell you that. It's like, you know, this is what could happen, you know? So realize you really got to open that communication. OK, this is it, local or, stand, or national. They have pretty much the most court cases have thrown out national standards of care. And it comes down to more local standards of care in most all the states. But I'm telling you, just be aware of that in your state. And everybody's a little different. For instance, does your state require malpractice insurance? Do you know it, or you just carry it? I know signing contracts for insurance companies, that's a death trap right there, because that puts you into a standard of care that the insurance company dictates by a nurse that usually is dictating what you can treat or not treat. We do a cash practice. I do not deal with the insurances. And when you, when you sign an insurance contract, most all of them require a three to $5 million malpractice insurance, which is a target for attorneys, literally a target. But some of your states require malpractice, and I'm sorry for these states that do that. It's a, not a good thing. So you got to look at what you do with techniques, procedures, following yourself up. Are you sticking a square peg in a round hole? Are you really doing what makes sense? You know, I was talking to Dr. Minkoff, who I've known for years and appreciate him. We were talking about procedures and techniques and products we use. The FDA just outlawed three products last week. Okay? I've already planned for that. I knew it was coming. So we developed a product that's a homeopathic, that's an oral product, that's a supplement, that's not an injectable drug. We beat the FDA. We already circumvented them. Can't touch us. But you can use it off-label. And I'll explain this, how that was used as we go along here. So you got to play the game. You cannot beat them at the game. You can't fight the FDA to get those things back. It's just not going to work. But Brendan can tell you he's fought it for years with a lot of stuff. They took 300 natural supplements, su substances out in the last three years, Brendan, four years. Yeah, they're after B12 too, just so you know that. Methylene blue. Um, you know, so they've done a lot with a lot of stuff to help us a lot. And they're helping patients, right? Yeah, well. Okay, let's talk about informed consent. How many of you have informed consents in your office? Most all of you probably do to some degree. Some offices go overboard with this. They have an informed consent for giving a vitamin to uh, go into the bathroom. I mean, it's just a whole bunch of stuff you can do. You know, is it necessary? And I'm going to show you our informed consents. And you can download these and print them off. So I won't go through all of it together, but I'll give you the basic concept of what we do. And so informed consent, you state basic terms. I've had pages with patients, excuse me, doctors on malpractice cases with, with informed consents that are six pages long on an adjustment. We absolutely rip them apart. Because the data they have to do it are making claims of, oh, we have one in two million risk of uh, a stroke during adjustment. We have one or two million risks of, of paralysis. That will get you in nothing but in trouble. So be very basic how you do it, but be very concise how you think about it, and make sure if you make promises, you will get in trouble, I guarantee it, because I can rip you apart. I've done it with lots of people on poor procedures. And if I find a case that's wrong, I'll tell the insurance company, they're wrong, better settle this case. So I have no problem with that either. And if you ever want me to look at stuff, I'll be very honest with you. You may or may not like it. I'm not an attorney. I just deal with these damn attorneys. And they are not very educated. There are no attorneys here, are there? So full knowledge, possible risks, and benefits. That's spooky. Because you could start listing 100 things that go wrong with anything. So you'd be very simplified, this thing. And I've got informed consents for you on this, so you'll be able to see what we use. The legal concept, what's the legal concept of informed consents? Was well, agreement to interact or actions rendering with knowledge of relevant facts such as risk involved in any available alter alternatives. Informed consents often comes up in the con context of legal ethics, medical treatment, and waiver of constitutional rights. 
So you basically give away your constitutional rights when you put too much stuff on informed consent. Now, I will tell you that um, this young lady comes as a patient. Um, we're going to cut your thyroid out today and do a frontal lobotomy on you because it'll settle you down and you feel better. You okay with that? Okay, we're going to do it anyhow. No. But she has a constitutional right for her and I to make an agreement of what she's consenting to in her office is your constitutional right in the United States. Not Canada, though. Canada, you're screwed. It's not your constitutional right in Canada. So every place is different. So realize, understand that you have that right to make an agreement what we're going to do. You know, we're going to inject this tea into you and do that. Or we're going to take your urine, spin it down, and inject it into you. Okay. Now, if I write down all that informed consent, that's going to give me a whole bunch of stuff that's going to not bode well in a legal thing. But if I say, we made an agreement that we're doing a procedure involving your urine, and you're okay with it, you sign it, and leave it at that, you're going to be fine with it. So understand how to put these together. And if you guys written your own informed consents, you pull them from somebody else. Nobody's written their own. We write our own. Shirley is a phenomenal writing putting these together. And we've talked to them, ran through them. And I deal with these darn attorneys all the time. And they go, oh, that looks fine. Who knows if that means anything. Treatment options. Here's the things you need to ask yourself on every treatment option. Is it safe? Easy? Highly effective and affordable. If you go with a patient, you see them the first time, and you're going to recommend a $10,000 procedure, and it doesn't work the way they wanted, will they be very happy? No. It may have been the right procedure, but the wrong timing. And I say that in the respect that when you pick a procedure, and a lot of you watched me do procedures today, it took very little time. We got a basic result. We charged for initial exam, $25 procedure, $50 exam in my office. We're going to see this from blood work. We'll follow up with some more things after that. Then we'll check if we want to do IVs or deep injections or what we want to follow up with you after that. So you, you kind of walk them into it. So, you know, watch that when you do those, when you mine out procedures and protocols for patients, that you have a very valid point you're coming from in a logical steps to the next thing. And following up with basic blood work, screens, things like that are really important. So those are all important, important issues in this whole game of things here. This is my favorite one, there's no silver bullet. So a lot of pieces in the puzzle. If you're on one silver bullet, you're gonna get shot down. I love building these PowerPoints. This is where I do my fishing. If most of you know me, I fish 35 to 40 days a year, and my wife plays on the boat and sunbathes the whole time, and I drive around, write my book. I wrote my book on the boat during COVID, and I work four days a week and spend Thursday through Sunday on the reservoir during the summer, and I uh, just kind of really contemplate the meaning of life and why I'm doing what I do. That's at the end. So the patients, what are they willing to pay, and what are you willing to pay as far as what are you willing to give up to treat a patient? You'll give up your ethics. Are you willing to give up your money? Are you willing to give up your house? You got to keep that in mind when you go to treat a patient, what's going to cost you and the patient. And again, you can't read this very well, but it's on your things, you can download and do it, all right? So I put that on there for you guys. And one thing I will say that I put on one of them is that I am practice, uh, practicing as an unlicensed practitioner. So my procedures on alternative care are as an unlicensed practitioner. So if you get under the boards, if you're on a medical board coming after you and you're treating traditional Western medicine, and you do that without a license, you're, treating, you're practicing medicine. If I would do alternative care, that's not chiropractic, it's not naturopathic, it's not medical, then I'm treating without a license. The patient says I'm treating you as a non-licensed practitioner. No, I've never had anybody say a word, ever. I've done probably, we see 50 to 70 patients a day, and I've yet to date to have an issue at all. I've done about 45 to 50,000 injections, and probably 10,000 IVs of what we do. 
and you just really, again, basic information, not a lot, okay? That's for informed consent for vitamin C, okay? This is injection IV and ozone. So same sort of thing, same basis, very simply, very easily lined out there for your ease of utilization. You know, use the model. I don't care which copy, it's up to you guys, but just think about what I'm trying to tell you and what your more high risk issues are that you think they're going to be that way. Now, here's the high risk one stem cell procedures. You listened to Dr. Joy Kong talk earlier today. We actually trained Joy years ago. And it's interesting because you've got to tell that person the right thing. If they come in thinking they're going to get a stem cell, you are screwed. None of those project, products have over 3% stem cells in them. I don't care if you get cell counts, all your stuff like that, you're not getting that. Using a biological allograph. And a biological allograph feeds your stem cells to reproduce your stem cells to de-differentiate and transmigrate to the areas they need to go. And we're very clear. So we have a whole system we go through on this. And we go through this checkoff system. They read all that. I'm understanding I'm not getting someone else's stem cells. They realize that. We make sure they read this very closely. And again, you have all this on your, your sheet there. And it goes through all the little particulars about it. And the other thing it is that we are very selective. We only use cells that are pre, or products that are pre-COVID. We don't use any post-COVID collected products. We have 27,000 stuck away in a bank of 2CC products, which will last us for several years now. What happens after that? Hopefully we'll have some testing to clear new donors to get products that we feel are totally safe. We have yet to know what this stupid spike protein is going to do. We do know we're working on some of the products that will stop the spike protein, but you can't even say that. Eptalon, one of the uh, peptides, actually will stop the spike protein in COVID. I just read studies on it two weeks ago. We add it to our product. Can we advertise that? No. You got to be damn careful. We don't put stem cell, we don't put ozone, we put nothing on any of our websites about that. So we keep that down. You know, there was a place in California that got shut down doing stem cells for macular. They had to go back, and the FTC came after them, not the FDA. <laughs> Made them pay back all the patients. Oh, it was a million dollars worth of patients they had to pay back. My mom got money back on it, which was, that's a long story. My, brother's, my brother makes more money than I do, so my mom said I should listen to my brother more because he knows more because he makes more money than I do. My brother does oil and gas, so figure that one out. But anyhow, and so these are all the things on there, and it's not FDA approved. I would say most of the stuff we use is not FDA approved. In fact, all of it isn't. So here's the deal. Ozone is not FDA approved. So what do you use? We use emergency oxygen in our office. There's no law against using oxygen yet. Not that there may not be. So my board allows us to use emergency oxygen. Well, we need to do some injections with a procaine and emergency oxygen on you. We bypass the whole system. That's why we don't post that we use ozone. You know, I'm just telling you, that's the only place we have it is in our private um, websites that we use ozone, and that's under our video libraries. And you all get free access to that for a month. You can pick up a card. And I encourage you all to download protocols and a lot of things on there you'll be able to use. So we're trying to make it easy for you guys and safe. If some of you start screwing up and advertising a lot of ozone and stem cells and crap like that, it's going to hurt all of us. I will only allow patients to buy products from us that actually are educated and understand why and have heard me talk and listened to me talk and let me talk to them. I don't want someone using products we've got and making promises that don't work and coming back after us. So I'll give you a real quick example. How many are familiar with the drink Bang? He lives down by you, Dr. Minkoff, down in Miami. Um, we've been down to his house. He built this product that was a great amino acids and all stuff in it. Well, he decided to put on the can a super creatine on it. It was an energy-based creatine he put into the product. So guess what happened? I just found this out a couple months ago. He bought a... He bought a uh, Fancy jet, has a huge mansion we went to down there. <clears throat> Coke and 
monster drink, sued him for $600 million because they tested the product and it had no, there was no such thing as super creatine that he put on the can. He lost everything he had. They bought the company out from underneath them for pennies on the dollar, and now you buy a bang, it's now owned by Coke. So just watch yourselves, all right? I recommend you all at least read this and understand this. If you want to use a stem cell product, do not hesitate to call us. Talk to Shirley, myself, but read the stuff first here, semi-knowledge and, and uh, be careful of salesmen. A lot of times they sell people stuff. We had ones that were selling people that there was a Q code that you could build Medicare for doing stem cell injections. Medicare is now systematically going after all his offices and demanding full return on all his offices. They're charging five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars for treatment, and Medicare was paying it. Shirley, what's your comment about Medicare or about insurance companies? It's like chumming for sharks. They give it, they take it away. And Brenda can tell you that, they're horrible at doing that. So, we have choices of what kind of crap we eat. And I said just in general, what we learn, what we see. This is my favorite all-time meal. Liver's worst, hot radish, a little beer, onions, and uh, hot mustard. That's my uh, one-time fishing trip, uh, healthy snack. You know, we can do stuff like that every once in a while. And I think we all find that a lot of things we do outside of our limit every once in a while. And so I want you to be aware that that does exist and you can do that. But you got to make choices. And you choose, your patients choose. And there's a big thing I'm going to tell you that goes back to this informed consent. If you had a patient that wants you to do something that you don't want to do, do not do it. I had a doctor, a friend of mine, that the patient talked him into adjusting him when he documented that he shouldn't adjust him. Blood pressure 180 over 120. The guy had a stroke. Fortunately, it wasn't bad. And he had the best notes I've ever seen. Document. And he literally wrote him, and I looked at it and said, settle the case. They settled it for $300,000. And I met with the doctor's good friend of mine. He said, we've trained in his office. He said, I know I screwed up. I let the patient talk me into something I shouldn't do. That's the worst, worst, worst thing you'll ever do is let a patient talk you into something and not take responsibility. He said, you choose what you put in your mouth. If you let a patient dictate what you know is not safe or that, you had better damn well not do it. Say no. Learn to say no. I want you all to say no right now. No. <laughs> just remember that. If you learn nothing for this weekend, just say no. My wife will tell you that right now. Every time she asks me something, what do I say? No. Yeah, I've learned that. My wife will ask me, honey, that's the first word. I say no. <laughs> so, honestly, it's the truth. <laughs> So you've got to run through something that's just a, a, and this is where our protocols are all written out for you to, to, to use. You know, have an idea of what the, the pathway is going to be for the patient. Low back injection. Three injections in six weeks. PMF in between, change the diet around, height and, hot and cold, quit doing activities to 10% what they're doing, add 10% on for 10 weeks, cut them back. Use a basic predetermined thing you talk to patients. Patient comes in after injection, I'm going to say, because of B12, you're going to pee red. I'm going to say that uh, women at your activities, you're going to feel sore as heck for 24 to 48 hours, which only 20% do, but I still tell them that. And you should see 20 to 40% improvement within a week. We've actually eliminated 95% of our back surgeries in the last 15 years we used to do since doing injections. And I've took the numbers. We sent 12 to 14 a year to surgery. We've had two girls surgery in 15 years. And they didn't need to go to surgery. And so I'm able to tell patients we've had a great rate of success. Never, 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 never say, we can fix you for sure. Because you'll get yourself in trouble with that one too. Really gauge your responses. You know, your knee's really bad, it's bone on bone, the ligaments are loose, you got a 20% chance of getting 60% improvement, period. Don't hesitate to break that down into some logistic things and always underestimate. No, you only told me 50% chance. I'm 75% better. Oh my God, it's amazing. So a patient gets worse when they come in. Sure, so, what do you tell them? Oh, that's great. 
So we had a patient, first time she heard me say it to a patient, they were really sore after whatever I injected. I said, oh my God, that's amazing, that's so cool. And they go, they, they just kind of stop for a minute. Well, that means it had inflammation, it's breaking it down, and it's doing the best job ever because we got a reaction. Worst reaction is no reaction. So you're in the wrong playing field. You want to get better or worse, or you don't want to stay the same. Those are three things that happen, or better or worse, or stay the same. So what I'm trying to tell you with this whole thing is gauge your response as well with how you talk to patients. And I think that's the most important thing to learn is to take each patient and you control their care. Don't let them control you. We had a very difficult patient in a week ago in Atlanta. Big six foot four guy, 25 years old, knew everything. His family had a history of MS and a bunch of weird things. She used lots of terminology. He knew how to diet. So I literally took him, had him take his shirt off, grabbed his tummy and said, God, you're doing great. And I wiggled his fat tummy. And there's a big burly. I said, you're pretty buff. And I wiggled his tummy. And that shut him down. Literally, I have a half hour of him arguing with the staff there that shut him down. I heard one of the best issues with the uncontrollable patients that I heard from Dr. Fernandez. Patient was just totally arrogant, wanted to tell him what to do, things like that. He said, okay, strip down your underwear, stand on that, sit on that rolly stool. Left him there for 15 minutes, half naked in this little chair. Disarmed him. You know, learn little tricks you go along in those difficult patients or just don't treat him at all. So, you know, I think you need to see a neurosurgeon or a psychologist, one of the two. So, you know, I'm just telling you, those are the ones that will get you in trouble. Because he, he, he wanted his elbow injected because he had bursitis sometimes. Bursitis sometimes or tendonitis, that does not happen. I felt his arm, I couldn't find anything. I'm not going to inject your arm. Well, I want you to inject it because ozone will fix it. There's nothing there to fix. You're working too hard on it. You need to back off and get your flipping diet around. You're eating crap. He said, well, yeah, I'm doing all these monster drinks all day. So you had better be responsible for this. Then I grabbed his gut and wiggled it. You know, just realize those little tricks are the best thing you're going to do. And I've done this for enough years where I'm kind of brazen about that stuff. We use BA and ozone. I do not use allografts or stem cells on the first visit, almost never. It's a second, third, or fourth visit treatment. I make sure that patient is primed and wants to. They come in and say, I want stem cells on my wrist or elbow. You don't need stem cells. We can do ozone and fix it. You do not need to do this. I mean, you can spend this money. We had an owner of one of the car lots come up. And uh, he said, why you fix my friend's shoulder with, with stem cells? I said, yeah, but you don't need stem cells. You need, this, you need that motion in the joint and the wrist to restore. We restored it. One visit, he was happy as hell, never did stem cells. So again, you do what's best. Do not let the patient tell you what to do. That's where you get legally in trouble every damn time. And again, reduce inflammatory foods, which is the biggest deal. And we're really sticking with now, and you talk to Dr. Brendan, he'll say the same thing on really towards, and Dr. Minkoff said the same thing, a carnivore, non-inflammatory diet, and I know you hate red meats, but red meats for at least a month, and I'm amazed at doing that. We done? We done? Two minutes? So, this is pretty simple. I know, you know, and let me tell you why the book is important. I don't care if any of you read it. It was important to me. It was one of my accomplishments. I did, and it was very satisfying. I made a list up of 128 things in 1991 I wanted to accomplish. I've done 95 of them. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Cochran. And we've been friends. I actually married him and his wife. I didn't marry them, but I married them. <laughs> good, good question. Big happy part. Big happy Well, the fun part was we gave him a, a two weeks in, in um, Thailand, but we had to go with him. So we suffered. Where did they get the fire? You got it? Do you have any questions while Dr. Cochran looks at that? Questions? Answers? Comments? Was that helpful? Yeah. Nobody, nobody did it. If you can't apply them, you're screwed. Very simple. Say, yes, do the back. So, 
So a few things are going on, and I'll just jump ahead because I don't have the slides, but you'll get them. I think they lumped them into the Thursday course instead. So the biggest thing, as of November 1st, a lot of rules changed. And I don't know if you saw that or not. They kind of sneak it underneath, and so you have to see. They, they do this a lot now. Instead of making a bunch of noise, they'll sneak a rule underneath you and expect you to know what's going on. So anything that has a commercially available product, such as hydroxocobalamin, which, by the way, if you get commercially available hydroxocobalamin, it has parabens in it, which are carcinogenic, right? Anything that has a commercially available label, you are, they're shutting down your ability for your compounding pharmacy to make it as a compound because it's identical to that. They're doing that with your vitamin C as well. So you'll see some of the compounding pharmacies are basically doing vitamin C and taurine if they're still compounding because there is a manufactured version of vitamin C therapy. So that's what they're really doing. So November 1st, you saw all of the peptides got pretty much gutted from uh, your USP use from your compounding pharmacies. If your compounding pharmacy hasn't been hit yet, it's just a matter of time when it will be hit. So the other thing that happened with on November 1st, not just your compounding pharmacies, but you as the practitioner's office, USP 503 compounding extrapolates to your office. And so therefore, it's been around, and it got easier in some regards, and you have to do basically different things in other regards. So they have something, they used to call it low, medium, and high risk. Now they call it CSP1, CSP2, CSP3. It's basically compounding sterile ingredients, different levels of that. A CSP1 with an immediate use exemption means you have to use three or less products in a syringe or bag, then it has to be administered into the patient starting within four hours. It used to be one hour. So we got a little bit better there, right? So that would be two, three ingredients in one syringe, or it would be two ingredients in one bag, because they count the bag as an ingredient, right? That's a vial. So you can get a vial with multiple ingredients in it. It's per vial. So that's immediate use exemption that you can do, and then you don't need to worry about any of the other things I'm going to talk about next. If you're outside of that range, right before November 1st, you had to have a clean room and you had to do gowning and garbing and have pretty much ISO 7 and ISO 8 air above you and ISO 5 hood. November 1st, they changed that and they made it a little easier for you. So you, as a physician, don't need to have ISO 7 or ISO 8 air most of you, depending on the complexity, because most of you aren't sterilizing product or using sterile product. And they basically made it so you uh, now don't need air, but you need a segregated area that's set up. And that segregated area still has to have ISO 5. And then the big difference is now they want you to do testing. Did you have your slides? <laughs> it was on the Thursday. They put it in the wrong area. Thursday, you guys have it Thursday, right? Uh, last one of Thursday. That does not help me. <laughs> Although, if they were in there, they were... They were upstairs. upstairs. Well, I need that brought down then. I've never given well, that. I don't know. Macy and Mark had it. All right, it. we'll see about getting that. So, uh, basically what that means is it's easier for you and cheaper because if you did air changes like we had to do you're basically spending thirty five hundred dollars every six months on air changes nowadays the new rule november 1st basically they made it sound, say that you still need to do garbing and gowning if you're doing complex compounding of iv nutrients in your office you have a segregated area at least one meter away from an open door a window your fridge, any dirty source, right? And they just want you to do more extensive testing. So every month you do surface testing with a plate and document that you don't have growth. Every new employee or every six months, they basically want you to document a media fill. So practicing that you're filling a vial or accessing a vial without contaminating it. 
surface testing and glove fingertip testing of whoever's doing it. They want that every six months. So that's kind of the new guidelines that they want if you're doing USB compounding. That is your federal guideline. Who enforces that is basically your state board of pharmacy who is, who's enforcing that. Now what you're going to see if you use compounding pharmacies, their rules have changed too. They're beyond use date that you used to be able to get for six months to longer is getting reduced to 30 to 60 days now. It doesn't make any sense. So what they want you to do is make less batches. The compounding pharmacist now has to go in and out of the clean room more often, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's what you're going to see. So already, a lot of the compounders have doubled their prices on a lot of injectables because of the cost they have to do with all this testing as well. So just letting you know it's out there. Um, it's on that PowerPoint. I went over all the details. You can look at what I mean, every little step for that specific thing. So what they're doing is they're ultimately trying to eliminate as much as they can and force as much pressure on us as they can. Nebraska, in the last, I'd say, three weeks, passed a law that any practitioner, unless you have a pharmacy license, cannot mix any ingredients into a bag at all. Period. Period. Can't do it unless you have a pharmacist on staff now. Right? Uh, Carolina has a rule in effect for that. They've also done that to some of the states for nurses where you can't just start up an IV. You have to have a provider meet with the, meet with the patient. The provider has to prescribe and document why they're prescribing things. So a lot of this is going on right now, just so you're aware of what's going on. And it's not going to get, unfortunately, easier um, as what they're doing is they're kind of putting pressure, like Dennis said, on different states and organizations, et cetera. So you got to figure out how to play the game. And, and there's a lot of things you can do around that, like off-label usage. Any of you use mistletoe from the US here? There's a pharmacy called Uriel. Well, they make it up in Wisconsin. They're in little glass ampules. What do they say on the box? Oral sips. They put a little coffee straw in there. Oral sips. Because in the US, you can't use injectable mistletoe. It's off-label use is what they do to get around that. All right? So a lot of places are doing off-label to play that game. It's, we were up in uh, Windsor, Ontario last week, and it's very interesting because this is the same game they're playing with their government. It's like, well, we couldn't get raw dairy because the government wouldn't allow that, so all the farmers sold their dairy cows, and now they have raw buffalo milk. And nobody can regulate the buffalo, so... I'm like, that's brilliant. So there's these games that you can still play to get around, but like I said, it's, it's happening. So if you're setting up your room, if you're going to do complex infusions, look at my slides. I know they're not up there. I know you guys have them. Look at those. They'll give you everything you kind of need to know if you're doing that and you're trying to protect yourself from that. And know that you're not alone. I've been into some clinics that literally I go in and they have like the mixing area on their counter and they have a sink and a ham sandwich and then blood sampling right next to it. I'm like, really? Come on, at least be clean about this. Don't be mixing on there. And then one of the more recent ones, I was like, wow, I didn't think it could get worse than the ham sandwich example was somebody had a hood in a shower and they have a fan vent and they have a shower and they literally have a curtain on their shower, and they have a fridge, and then they have the crapper right next to the shower. And they think that that's a clean mixing space. I'm like, um, you got some problems here. I wouldn't want to be getting an IV from you. So think about you know, being clean if you're going to do that and understand the complexity that you're doing. Now, a lot of the pharmacies, they're also getting smart with things, so they are mixing vials with multiple ingredients. They call them like little Myers mixes and stuff. So we are evolving for those specific things as well. So that's kind of one legal thing. The other thing in your offices, and, and you'll look in there, like you see Dr. Minkoff, in order to get to that level, you have to have systems and organization. You have to, and you have to understand the business of health, not just the health of business. And I think a lot of people forget about that, and they grow their clinic if you're new, 
And then five years later, it implodes because you don't have the fundamentals of everything set up in your clinical practice. They focus on the sophisticated stuff, but not the fundamentals of operations and leadership and uh, marketing. Those things are necessary for a successful practice to run. A lot of places I've been to, it's terribly disorganized. The doctor's stressed out. The nurses and the doctors aren't communicating. There's no systems written down. It's just on the fly. And to be honest, a lot of the places I've been to, and even with dentists, we've been to some pretty big places. We were up in one place. They had 30,000 square foot clinic in northern Idaho. They have 98 employees, and they're broke. And further inquire, I mean, if they look good, everything looked good. This is a medical doctor. Everything looked good on paper. You, get, you dig into it further, 68 of the employees work for clinical trials for Pfizer, and the rest of them work in the clinic, and they're doing nothing in their clinic to make income. And so buying a lot of toys without having that organization or that structure is something you want to think about before you get into that big monster of buying every single toy and being like kids in a candy store. Think about what you're passionate about seeing, what kind of patient you want to see. Build your formula, build your box, and add to it. And while you're doing that, also pay attention to what's going on around you. What are the patients looking for? What are the legalities of things? Unfortunately, IV nutritional therapy, I hate to see this, say this, it's changing. It's a tool that is dying. And it's unfortunate because we have these med spas abusing it. We had a person, you know, die, if you haven't heard of that, in Texas in a med spa because they didn't have a medical personnel infusing an IV. That doesn't help all of us. So it, it, every tool comes and goes. And if we abuse a tool, more regulations come. And that's why you heard my lecture earlier with EBU and ozone. We got to be doing it the right way. And like Dennis said, do it the right way. Be very transparent with your patients. Don't promise cures. Don't market your tools. Market the results and the success you get in your clinical practice, and people will come and find you. Okay? Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> so, Dr. Cochran, I appreciate the honest statement. One thing we've done is we've eliminated as many injectables as possible to make it simple. So, put all that in one, one thing instead of nine or ten things. Once you go to those limits, you have your requirements to do that. So simple is easy. So I have really appreciate everyone here. And uh, if you want to come to join us in Puerto Vallarta, it's two for one in January. We go for three days, and it's a lot of fun. We'll talk about lots of fun things, plus whale watching. And a bug around my face. All right, everyone. Be safe. Love you all.